David, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for uh, allowing me to join you this evening. Uh, a few of us were at a number of meetings over the weekend with the IMF and I promise you that uh, my comments and I, I hope His Excellency also will not be as long as uh, one of the dinners attended on Saturday night where the speech was one hour and 15 minutes. This is just a little bit shorter. Um, uh, I have had a chance to visit the Indonesia. Uh, it's a country I've uh, loved on first sight, not only because my boss and president spent several years of his childhood there, but it's a country that's uh, vibrant, uh, a democracy, 250 million people, uh, a, a, a richness in entrepreneurship, uh, and ready for economic opportunity. Uh, one of the uh, pleasures of this job is I've gotten uh, a chance to get to know uh, the ambassador, uh, Dino Jalal, and his beautiful wife, Rosa, and they do a magnificent job here. So let's give them a round of applause. And it's clear that uh, Indonesia, this is a time whose a, a country whose time has come. Now, I'm still a relative newcomer at the bank. I've been at Exim Bank for about two and a half years. Uh, our history with Indonesia goes back 60 years. Uh, in fact, in 1950, uh, with about a $100 million loan, and I still think $100 million is a lot of money, but it was really a lot of money in 1950. And it had to do with the investment in infrastructure, rail, power, and so forth after World War II. And, uh, <clears throat> And it also included uh, telecommunications, though I would say in those days, we didn't call it telecommunications. I think we simply called it POTS, plain old telephone service. So, but six decades later, we see a lot more opportunity. And I think a clear, productive partner in building infrastructure and building ways that we can together build and raise more people out of poverty and also create an opportunities for a vibrant middle class. Now, Indonesia, and probably the reason I was invited here, is one of nine countries we've identified at Exim Bank as having unique opportunity. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you who the other nine are, just because everybody likes to know who the, who's in the club. Uh, in Asia, it is Indonesia, Vietnam, and India, uh, moving around the world, Turkey, Nigeria, South Africa, and in this hemisphere, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. And in 2011, our portfolio in Indonesia grew to about two billion dollars. And one of our favorite customers there is this one right here, Lion Air. Now, I usually like to tell audiences that uh, not only do we help export the planes to Lion Air, we also frequently export the models, though I regret to say I turned this one over and this one was made in Taiwan. <laughs> I've gotten to know the two founders. Uh, Kusan Arusti Karana, and uh, they started as a travel business, and I had a chance to get to know them in the last two and a half years, and in fact, the ambassador and I were talking just in the last two weeks. They took their 50th delivery of a Boeing 737-900ER. <laughs> they were the launch customer for this aircraft, and what is this aircraft in this company embodies what we try and do at Exim Bank. Uh, in 2000, when the company was just getting started, they had 76 employees. Today, Lion Air employs over 10,000 people in Indonesia and the region. And at the same time, it created thousands upon thousands of jobs in the United States. That's really what this is about. It's about really creating jobs in both countries, creating some mutual dependency in a positive way on each other's economy to grow and hit new heights. And what I'm also excited about, because not only was it the aircraft, but the actual model of the business. This low-cost carrier follows the model of Southwest Airlines. So I feel that in some ways, not only are we exporting a product, we're also exporting a, way, a method and a way of doing business. Now, Indonesia was one of the very first countries I had a chance to visit in my first year at the bank. And when I was 
in Jakarta, and I know Ted Osius is here. I saw him earlier. I don't know where he's sitting. There he is. Uh, was at, at Ted's home, and it's just down the street where a young Barack Obama was playing in school and in and, uh, and sports field. And I heard about many entrepreneurs who were excited about the opportunities, excited about building infrastructure, excited about what was the promise ahead, and excited to be looking forward to doing business with the United States and with U.S. companies. I had a chance to witness a very young democracy, one of the fastest growing economies, and what we want to do at Exim Bank is to make sure that the financing is in place to help fuel that growth. And we're excited about Indonesia's plan to invest about a quarter of a trillion dollars, $250 billion in infrastructure in the next five years, and we very much want to be a part of those investments. And we want to have the high quality U.S. goods, high quality innovative goods, because if we do that, we can build much deeper relationships between our two countries. We can build relationships in the business community that will spill over into other parts of our relationship. Because at the end of the day, the power of trade, the power of business goes beyond just exchanging goods and services. It lays a foundation for both of our countries to build on prosperity, on security, on economic opportunity. And if we think about what countries do together, they reflect what they value, their goals, their hopes, their aspirations. And if we think about our futures together, it's a way of bringing us much closer together. It's investing in each other's, in each other's people. And in some ways, it makes us less foreign to each other. And that, I think, is a good thing. So I'm hoping that we can continue the trade and that Exim Bank can continue to help facilitate that. We can have more evenings like tonight where we get to know each other. We can have more student exchanges, cultural exchanges, and other things that bring our two countries closer together. Because I think that way, we will have a much stronger and more durable bond. Now, I was also asked to introduce our keynote address this evening. And um, at first, I was a little bit nervous because I had not met the finance minister uh, until Saturday when I was here for, and he was here for a number of meetings with the World Bank. And I had a chance to meet, and I told him the hardest part was going to be his name. I had a chance to meet August Marto Adoyo. <laughs> And I will tell you, um, leadership is about optimism, and it's also about having a healthy dose of reality. And August has both of those, and in abundance. We met the first time over the weekend during the IMF meetings, and those qualities were in evidence and in abundance at the time we spent together. And without any exaggeration whatsoever, the meeting we had on Saturday morning was the most dynamic, productive, and energizing meeting of the weekend. And I will tell you, my team and I went to many, many meetings, many, many long meetings. And so there was a lot of competition. But there was no question this was the highlight of our meeting in terms of our engagement with a country. And I, that has a lot to do with what Agus brings to this position. And what was keenly interesting to me is his focus on bringing power, bringing renewable power, tapping into the rich resource of geothermal power in Indonesia to make sure that, we, that Indonesia lifts more people out of poverty and makes them part of the formal economy and lays a foundation for really capitalizing on what this great country has to offer. Um, the finance minister is focused on increased transparency, regulatory reform, um, and what is needed to really bring vital infrastructure to this vast country of 250 million people. Uh, he, as you all know, is an economist by training um, and worked in many sectors of the economy, uh, was, um, and prior to be becoming a finance minister, was one of the top bankers in Indonesia. He also headed up the Export-Import Bank, so I know that uh, perhaps I will learn something about what my next job might be as well. Um, but he's really clearly applying those financial skills and those business skills and those skills of 
of diplomacy to India, Indonesia's fiscal situation, its economic growth, and the opportunities for its people. Um, so I feel very confident that we have a, a partner in uh, working with uh, Agus, and uh, he is clearly the right man at the right time who is poised to help grow and increase the economic opportunities in this great country. So with that, this is a person who really does not need an introduction in this room, but let me bring to the stage and bring to the podium uh, someone who I'd like to call my new friend, uh, August Marcho Wadayo, and please join us at the podium. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Fred Hopper, for that very kind introduction. Hopefully, I deserve some of your kind words. It makes me nervous when the introduction sounds potentially better than my speech. and that you also, Fred, for Exim Bank's designation of Indonesia as one of your nine priorities market. Let's beat WikiLeaks to keep leaking the best kept secret that Indonesia is the next emerging economy to watch. And thank you, Ambassador David Merrill, for hosting this wonderful dinner, and especially your active and creative leadership and the valuable contribution of Yusindo to U.S.-Indonesia relations. And thank you, David, for your assurance that this cloud is much friendlier than the one who usually welcome delegates with lively chance at World Bank IMF annual meetings. <laughs> Let me first extend the warmest greetings of President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono to all of our good friends here at the Yusindo Saladino. He looks forward to his visit to Hawaii this November to attend APEC Economic Leaders Meeting. I believe that it was in this Yusindo Forum that he unveiled his fresh vision of a strategic partnership between our nation in 2008. I'm also very pleased to report to you that the Indonesian-American Comprehensive Partnership is progressing rapidly. Since the visit of President Barack Obama to Indonesia in November last year, there has been much action. Things are looking up. Trade is up. Investment is up. Exchanges are up. Visits are up. Visa applications from students are up. Collaborations are up. Most of the relationship are on upward trajectory. Ambassador Dino Jalal told me that at least 13 Indonesian ministers have visited the U.S. in the past three months, and also many provincial governors. The second Joint Commission meeting met in Bali last July, and the relationship is now no longer just working, but running. The U.S.-Indonesia relationship is truly becoming a model of a 21st century forward-looking equal partnership based on shared ideas 
common interest and mutual respect. My task tonight is to convince you that only that not only we are on the right track, but that I'm ever more optimistic about what lies ahead in terms of Indonesia future development and the expansion of US Indonesia relations. For all that is going on with the world economy, this is still an, and will continue to be an opportunity bring on the relationship. Before I focus on the investment opportunities that Indonesia offers and why you should make Indonesia your investment destination, let me say something about the implication for Indonesia of the recent economic turbulence on global financial market and the risk posed by the possibility of a global economic slowdown. As you may be aware, President Yudhoyono challenged the policymakers in the advanced economies to move forward with comprehensive solutions to respond to their economic challenges. The meeting over recent days, including the G20, provided us with the opportunity to reiterate this message. As regards Indonesia, we are not immune to global economic development. Nonetheless, the message that I want to underscore is that none of the fundamental drivers of Indonesia's recent success will be changed by a global slowdown. So, if investors turn away from emerging markets, as we can, as we have seen in the recent days, I can say that in Indonesia's case, this creates a great buying opportunity. If you recall, in 2008, while growth slowed, Indonesia recorded the third highest growth in the G20 after China, China and India. The same factors protect our growth performance this time. This includes the importance of domestic demand in driving our growth, strong balance sheet in the public and private sectors, and the policy space to support growth should that be needed. Financial markets have been affected as evident all around the world. In this regard, there have been outflows from Indonesia's bond and stock market, and the rupiah was weakened against the US dollar, similarly to exchange rate moves in other currencies. While these market pressures can be significant, we are better placed than in 2008, with more than twice the level of international reserve at over $120 billion. Moreover, we have established mechanism to intervene to moderate excessive volatility in the bond market. So while we certainly hope and make the case for policy action in the advanced economies, if the outlook is weaker than expected, we are well, well placed to mitigate the consequences. The strong balance sheet, a strong and sound fiscal policy to anchor macroeconomic stability the opportunities from a market of 240 million people, the demographic advantage, the burgeoning middle class, and our natural resources will continue to make Indonesia an attractive destination for investment. And this is the subject on which I want to focus this evening. The rest of the world is recognizing our accomplishment and opportunities and we are delighted to see that, that investment is becoming an even stronger engine of growth for the Indonesian economy. With our strong economic fundamentals, large market, attractive demographics, natural resources, and untapped opportunities, I'm sure that many of you are keen to learn about the, how our economy is progressing and the investment opportunities that exist in Indonesia. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the vital sign for the Indonesian economy are at their strongest in the last decade, and fundamentals are improving. 
Indonesia weathered the global credit crisis very well. And Indonesian GDP growth has been very stable in the past 10 years. GDP growth was 6.5% in the second quarter of this year, which is higher than 6.1% recorded last year. We expect to achieve 6.7% growth in 2012. The economic expansion has not only been sustained, but has also gained momentum benefiting from solid economic fundamentals and robust domestic demand. Despite positive growth, the fragile global economic situation does pose challenges, as I have said earlier. To offset any global weakening, fiscal policy in 2012 will include contingency measures to provide stimulus to boost the economy if needed. Indonesia is on the cusp of a virtuous growth cycle. Indeed, looking ahead in the medium term, we expect growth momentum to accelerate to 7% by 2013, much faster than the, we have achieved in the last decade. We have also set our target for growth to reach 7.3% by 2014. The economic growth will primarily be supported by improvement in consumption and investment, including infrastructure investment, and we hope we also benefit from solid export growth. In 2010, our inflation rate reached almost 7%, resulting from commodity price increase. But this year, we are confident that we can contain the inflation rate to below 5% within the target for 2011. Our inflation in August was 4.79% year-on-year, which was driven mainly by increasing food prices. But Indonesia is not alone. Other emerging economies are also suffering from the adverse situation. This resurgence in growth and domestic demand has yielded fresh opportunities for investment. Indeed, thanks to our strong export and capital inflows, our international reserves have climbed to the highest level in our history. Reserves were $124 billion by August 2011, which is close to four times their level in 2005. Accordingly, to minimize the risk of exchange rate instability and the impact of sharp capital reversal, we have implemented several strategies to strengthen monetary and fiscal coordination. We have strengthened the capital management protocol and established a bond stabilization fund. We believe these measures will add greater stability and resilience to our growth path. For Indonesia, the core of our virtual cycle is the strength of the revival in domestic demand with consumption contributing up to 60% of GDP. Another positive rating factor is our balance sheet, which has strengthened significantly since the Asian financial crisis. For instance, our public debt stands at around 26%, and the fiscal deficit is budgeted to be at 22.1% of GDP in 2011, and declined to one and half percent in 2012. Furthermore, to maintain financial stability on the fiscal side, the government is committed to continuing to decrease the level of external and government debt and move, all, move towards a balanced budget in 2014. In the effort to broaden our fiscal space, the government is to gradually reduce energy subsidies such as through continuing kerosene conversion to LPG, improving supervision on the distribution of subsidized fuel, and increasing renewable energy utilization. In 2012, the government planned to increase the electricity tariff, except for the poor. 
a major policy objective is to make Indonesia more investor friendly. On the investment regulatory front, we will continue to streamline our licensing procedure as well as reform our tax and customs administration. At the same time, we have started a process of revoking local regulations that conflict with national regulations. So far, more than 4,800 such regulations have been identified and already 1,800 of these have been revoked. In order to tap the investment potential, the Ministry of Finance has recently launched income tax reduction facility for strategic investment including investment allowance, dividend tax discount, accelerated depreciation, and longer loss carry forward. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Indonesian government have been working to ensure that future economic growth is more inclusive. This includes broader access to opportunities created by growth and to spread the benefit of growth more widely through fiscal and finance related initiatives. Despite achieving rapid growth recently, Indonesia has the potential to achieve even higher growth rates given the wealth of its natural resources and strategic location. To meet this potential, the government of Indonesia recently released its master plan for the acceleration and expansion of Indonesia's economic development 2011-2025, aimed at accelerating economic growth rate in the range of 7 to 9 percent. The new plan is based on three strategies, the development of six economic corridors, the strengthening of national connectivity, and the exploration of technological and R&D capacity. The master plan identifies investment opportunities in 22 sectors, including palm oil, rubber, coal, nickel, copper, oil and gas, tourism, and communication technology. These nationwide investment opportunities are subsequently grouped into six regional corridors, Sumatra, Jawa, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, Bali, Nusa Tenggara Timur, and Papua, Maluku. In the case of Indonesia, we have identified that there are at least three main challenges preventing private capital investment in infrastructure projects, which are certainly of the land clearing, political risk in public-private partnership infrastructure projects, and the availability of long-term funding to finance long-term infrastructure projects. In response to those issues, the Ministry of Finance of Indonesia has set up three financial facilities namely land revolving fund, guarantee fund, and infrastructure fund. Land revolving fund was allocated to help investors with the financing of land acquisition up front and to deal with the uncertainty in land price. In Indonesia, land issue is the most critical one in developing the infrastructure. Guarantee fund was set to secure projects from a range of risks and to enhance their creditworthiness, while infrastructure fund has been established to bridge the domestic short-term fund to finance long-term infrastructure investment. We are working very hard recently to arrange a good interplay among those three facilities in supporting infrastructure investment through the public-private partnership scheme. Along the way, the government of Indonesia is also continuously refining the PPP, the Public-Private Partnership Framework, by, among others, reviewing the risk-sharing arrangement between public and private. For example, under the current Public-Private Partnership scheme, the land and the other fixed support needed by projects have to be secured by the government contracting agency in the front before the project is tendered. This new arrangement will provide a better risk allocation so that it can attract a private involvement. Given the abundant 
private funds flow into Indonesia recently, the government is keen to channel the private capital into long-term investment in infrastructure development. On the regulatory side, the government has proposed a land clearing law to the parliament and expect to be finalized this year, 2011. Further, we have collaborated with other international organizations such as the World Bank Group and OECD to benefit from international experience in shaping our infrastructure policies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with these exciting changes in mind, I would like to encourage you to continue make Indonesia an investment and business destination. Our commitment to ensure the best location for doing business extends to all who is who invest in the region, both domestic and foreign. Together we can build upon and take advantage of the solid economic base that exists to ensure sustainable and responsible growth into the future. Finally, I hope that my presentation gives you a deeper understanding about Indonesia's unique advantages and why Indonesia is one of the world's most rapidly expanding economies. Once again, I would like to thank all of you for attending this event. We deeply appreciate your participation and we look forward to having you as our partners in the future in Indonesia. Thank you and have a good evening.